So welcome everyone. Uh, we are so glad you're able to join us this evening. If you're watching this and with us live, uh, and if you're watching this later as a recording, welcome to you wherever you are. Um, it's my pleasure. I guess I should introduce myself first, just in case <laughs> that's confusing. I'm Wendy Geffen, uh, one of the rabbis at North Shore Congregation Israel, and uh, excited to be a part of uh, this important conversation this evening with Lonnie Nassiter. So Lonnie, I get to introduce you formally and then uh, a little informally, but I'll I'll start with the formal first, if that's all right. Uh, so hopefully, I think everyone here likely knows that Lonnie is the president and chief executive of the Jewish United Fund of Metropolitan Chicago. I understand you are the fifth ever uh, in this position. And it, in that, I think in many ways speaks to the longevity and continuity of the Chicago community and loyalty uh, that, that, that is here. And, and I think is like an incredible, unique part of our community in particular. And, um, you know, it means a lot. And it, that sort of continuity is evidenced in your career uh, before JUF. Um, in your capacity at ADL, uh, Chicago Midwest's office, um, really as the as the regional director, and uh, I think you you really have came to be known there as a as a real go to resource. Um, unfortunately, for anything and everything that has to do with anti semitism um, and any other forms of hate, your your career uh, spans back quite a bit in all sorts of public service. Uh, your role as a prosecutor early on, and uh, that long history led you to the place you are for all of us today. Um, and it's just worth saying that Lonnie stepped into his position at JUF just before everything fell apart in our world with a global pandemic. And, um, you know, under Lonnie's leadership, uh, the JUF was able to create an incredible safety net of support, care, presence in, in nearly every form um, for our community and the larger community uh, and, and continues to. So we are so grateful for all of that. And uh, Lonnie is just a wonderful friend and a colleague in the Jewish world and friend to many here uh, in this webinar as well. So welcome, Lonnie. We're so glad to have you. Well, it's great to be here. That was a really warm personal introduction, Wendy. And I've always treasured our relationship for many years. And you are just a terrific leader up on the North Shore. And for that matter, all of Chicago. And you are looked at by the rabbin and as someone that's a leading voice. Um, I go to you on issues all the time. I love the relationship that we've carved out and my relationship with North Shore growing up in Highland Park and, and being a part of that community for so many years and at ADL too, doing our Bearing the Witness program for so many years at North Shore with Rabbi Mason and you and and, and it was just been a great, great relationship. And um, that's why when you asked me a few weeks ago, would you do this? It took me one second to say, of course, uh, important topic, but also a community that holds a, a dear place in my heart. And thank you again for those warm comments. And I'm just excited to have a discussion about issues that are unfortunately pretty grim, but it's something I think we all need to be well aware of, apprised of, and react accordingly. Absolutely. Uh, so yeah, thank you on every level. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so Lonnie and I, when we were talking about this evening and, and what we wanted to cover, um, our initial plan uh, was developed before um, the, the war in Ukraine broke out. And as we were checking in, uh, in, in more recent days, it, it seemed appropriate that we spend just a little bit of time uh, naming what's right in front of us. Um, and I know that's, that's a great uh, concern, I hope to all of us on uh, certainly a particularistically Jewish level, um, but also certainly on a particularistically human and peace loving level. Mm -hmm. um, and so I, we just wanna spend a few minutes, if that's okay, uh, Lonnie, to just sort of learn a little bit about, um, you, you could share some reflections if you'd like, certainly about mm -hmm. um, what's going on. Um, I think in particular, the impact of um, this war on the Jewish community mm -hmm. uh, in Ukraine and perhaps more broadly, um, and just as a frame for everyone, you know, you you might or might not realize that 
you know, the Jewish people and uh, Ukraine have a, I'm going to call it a complicated, long history. Um, and at the same time of, of, of recent note is that there are over 200,000 Jews who live in Ukraine. There are um, 10,000 Holocaust survivors who live in Ukraine. Um, 40,000 elderly, under-resourced Jews who live in Ukraine. Um, so, so this is a community that, that has real um, significance for us as a Jewish community. And that, that call of Kol Yisrael Aravim Zelazah, all Jews are responsible for one another, seems to beckon loudly <laughs> um, here. So any, any thoughts about yeah. what's going on, comments? And I, I want to make sure we, we uh, reiterate about ways that we can help in immediate ways with the JUF fund that's been set up. So sure. Thank you for that. Yeah. So listen, tough time. I'm sure we're all sitting here, you know, glued to our TVs, our phones, et cetera, our newspapers, just to get a sense, get a sense of what's happening. So I can give you, you know, I've been briefed a lot in the last seven days. So I can give you a sense of it. And Wendy, you're right. This is a, a by Jewish standards, a large community, the fifth largest community in the world of Jews. Uh, so when you break that down, you say, wow, that's a lot of people didn't realize that until this crisis broke. So uh, the good news, that there's good news, is that there has always been significant infrastructure in the Ukraine for the last 20 or so years in terms of real organizations that do amazing work with the vulnerable that you just discussed. So there are several outposts for both the Jewish Agency for Israel and Joint Distribution Committee that have been on the ground really taking care of the most vulnerable. Um, to the tune of, you know, over 40,000 people are served in well over a thousand different sites in Ukraine before the war. So the infrastructure really has been in place to take care of the Jewish community. It's not just the most vulnerable, it's also engaging the next generation. And you're hearing a lot of stories of young Jews that are fleeing and where they're going and all the rest. So it, there's a vibrancy that now exists in Ukraine where they're allowed to be Jewish. We all know, obviously, both the president and prime minister are Jews. So while it is a country that unfortunately still has very strong anti-Semitic attitudes, the Jewish community continues, unfortunately, to flourish and to thrive and to live Jewish lives. So what we're seeing, unfortunately, right now is um, a mass evacuation. Um, well over a million Ukrainians have left their homes. Um, it's very hard for them right now in Kyiv and other parts of the north and the northeast to get out. But a lot are starting to get out from the south and the west. They're coming to five countries right now, basically. Um, you know, part of it is just Western Ukraine, but Moldova is another country. Poland, they're coming in significantly. Romania and Hungary are the others. So, um, you know, there is a lot of movement right now. We anticipate right now um, that well over 5,000 Jews will be seeking Aliyah right now who have gotten out. So that's a huge task for the Jewish Agency for Israel to figure out ways to get them given what's happening with airspace and all the rest, buses, trains, whatever it may be to get them out into a proper place to get them to Israel. If they stay, that's another story, um, but at least to get them out of harm's way and in a place that they feel comfortable, et cetera. Um, what's been challenging is figuring out ways to get to the most vulnerable. Uh, in these towns that are being besieged by rockets and missiles, it's hard to get up to the seventh floor for that 85 year old Holocaust survivor that is expecting the daily visits by the organizations I just mentioned. So that's a real difficult situation. Um, these, these organizations I'm talking about are trying every which way to figure out ways to get to the most vulnerable, but it's not easy. Um, and it, they're not leaving. So they're not mobile, um, unlike others that can get out. So that's a real issue. Um, this is gonna be one of those crisis that is going to probably have a long tail, meaning that we are gonna probably have to really dig in and invest for a long time on this one because no one really knows how it's going to end um, and there's a major upheaval and then the other piece Wendy you and I were talking about too is we also have many many Jews in Russia Putin's Russia right now who if you know the economy goes south which it's already going south that creates a whole nother level of issues both Jewish and non-Jewish of just regular Russians that may have significant challenges in their life as well. So this is, this is a serious issue on so many levels. Um, thank God that we have a structure in the Jewish world that is quick to move, mobilize, and figuring out ways to take care of 
of, of our community, our brothers and sisters that are there. I was on a call a few days ago where a, co a colleague from JDC was in sitting in Romania with his phone where there was a big JDC tent in Hebrew and in Russian that literally he was bringing soup and food to the people that are coming with their suitcases, mostly women, because we know that men 18 to 60 are staying and fighting, mostly women and their kids, giving them a hug, giving them soup, giving them kind of a warm embrace and getting them to figure out what their next steps are. So it's an amazing ecosystem. Um, we felt the need in Chicago to open up a fund because while those of you that give to the general campaign at JUF know that a huge chunk of our money goes to overseas, but they're going to have significantly more challenges than ever before. So we opened up a fund. Right now, the, the number that we're thinking for the whole country is about $20 million. And, uh, and I only think that's going to increase. So we felt the need to open it. We opened it on Tuesday. You can go to it at JUF.org. Uh, go specifically to the Ukrainian Relief Fund and all dollars that goes in goes directly to the organizations I just described. Um, and, and I hope that people that can do so will. We've gotten great response thus far, which has been tremendous. Um, again, we have in a community, Wendy, as you know, that is so generous and so amazing. I wouldn't be surprised if even though we're only 300,000 Jews in Chicago, we, uh, we represent the bulk of the money that's gonna come into the system, which is just, again, a testament to the generosity and the spirit that exists in our, our, our community. Absolutely. And yeah. for those, uh, those here who uh, go to NSCI, uh, we, we shared the link to the JUF fund and the information page in this week's Eve, uh, Eve last yesterday. Uh, so if you, if you miss that, you can go back to it and click on the link and you just scroll down to the end of the page and there's a direct link to donate to the fund should you, should you wish yeah. to. So. Just, just you guess, get a sense of scope, Wendy. We opened the fund uh, Tuesday around noon and we've already surpassed uh, $2.5 million. Amazing. Yeah. yeah, critically needed resources. So yep. thank, we're thankful to JUF for getting those into the right hands uh, so they can get into the right hands. Um, exactly. Thank you so much. Um, all right, so let's let's pivot. Let's pivot to a um, really optimistic and, and fun know. topic. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, you know, the it, it will be an interesting conversation, and I just want to give a little context to what birthed this conversation specifically. Um, I reached out to Lonnie uh, really uh, nearly immediately after the terror attack in Colleyville, Texas, um, uh, simply to um, open up a conversation about anti-Semitism, because uh, I think for many of us uh, that, that, I don't know that it was the straw that, that broke the camel's back, but it was, it was, it, it came even closer as if Pittsburgh hadn't come close enough um, as if the other attacks hadn't come close enough. I think for me, the moment that really um, switched something in my mind was when the initial reports from the authorities who were monitoring the situation and evaluating it claimed that it was not a hate-driven act. Um, which I think for many of us was stunning Mm -hmm. um, given what we already knew uh, was happening inside that synagogue, uh, how this person believed that there was some sort of centralized Jewish power structure um, governed by a single rabbi. I mean, it's amazing right. that, you know, this was a single female rabbi who was understood as the power broker for all of the Jews. But nevertheless, mm -hmm. you know, this was explicit extent and the, the evaluation initially was to completely deny the particular anti-Semitic focus mm -hmm. that drove and catalyzed this event. And it's, it seemed at least in my mind, and I don't think it was unique, that, that if that's what was being put out there, that their uh, call the Homer all the more so needed to be a conversation about this anti-Semitism. Yeah. Yeah. What is it? How is it manifesting mm -hmm. in our world? Mm -hmm. um, and so that's the place 
I kind of would love for us to begin and, and would love your thoughts on Lonnie. You know, JUF recently released its population study results. The Pew survey released its population study results and uh, shared, um, I can't remember what the actual percentage was, but it was something like 60, I think 70% in the Pew study of American Jews um, had the perception that anti-Semitism in America had increased substantially over the last five years in particular. I believe that was the framing mm -hmm. of that question. Mm -hmm. um, and there of course had been studies in previous years over the five years tracking and attesting to this increase in anti-Semitism. So I wonder, can you just 35,000 feet from the yeah. seat in which you sit and the background that you bring, right. offer a okay. little bit of an assessment of this? Sure, so let's first take Colleyville because you raise a really interesting point. And I don't think that SAC, who was from the FBI that came out with that statement, had any ill intentions when he mentioned what he mentioned. And I, I don't think you're insinuating that either, but it's reflective of a blind spot that I think many people in this country have when it comes to not fully understanding, as you said, what is anti-Semitism and why would a Jewish place be targeted because uh, people don't know the tropes. I mean, that line of Jewish control and all the rest comes right out of the playbook of the protocols from the elders of Zion, this notion that there's a Jewish cabal, Jews control everything, which clearly was something that animated this individual. And he probably got this read to him when he was a young man. I mean, let's call it what it is. This was a part of his you know, probably just upbringing was this notion that Jews are all powerful and many times they're, it's insidious and they're trying to do things for their own gain, all that kind of stuff. So, you know, that special agent in charge probably didn't have that type of background. Not that we have to educate all of America on anti-Semitism and its roots, but it's reflective of kind of, and we see this now in progressive circles too, for many other reasons, but there's kind of like a, well, anti-Semitism is kind of out here, not the same as other forms of hate. David Badial wrote an amazing book, you know, Why Jews Don't Count, which I'm sure many of you probably read. I read it recently also. And, and that's playing on the same types of themes. So it is reflective of something that we need to think about as a, as a, as a community and as a country. When it comes to anti-Semitism, I think the polling we see is actually reflective of the data. I mean, there's no question that the data is showing there's increases of anti-Semitic incidents. There's incidents that manifest itself into actual hate crimes. Those numbers are up. We continue as Jews continue to be by far the highest um, demographic when it comes to religiously motivated hate crimes by a landslide. I mean, it's not even close. There's no close second. It's Jews every single year. Um, but what makes the last couple of years different, I think, than the past is just the fact that we've seen this amazing spike. And we've also kind of seen this almost um, normalization of anti-Semitism that we haven't seen before. And what I also want to say on the good side of the ledger, I don't believe that in the last four years, five years, six years, this country now has 50 million more anti-Semites, Wendy. I don't believe that. I believe there's always been, and studies have shown this, that in the last 30, 40 years, there's always been this 8 to 12, 8 to 13 percent of Americans holding strong anti-Semitic attitudes. And so if you take that out, that's 30 million people. That's not a small amount of people. But nevertheless, those people were kind of marginalized. Like there was repercussions to being an anti-Semite in this country. Part of it's post-Shoah. Part of it was like, oh, Americans like, oh, anti-Semite, this is bad. Bad things happen to Jews in the 40s. We got to make sure that, you know, it's not going to happen here in this country. And then as it's kind of slowly, we get farther out from the Shoah. And then we also kind of get in a situation where, um, hate has almost kind of like the genie out of the bottle when it comes to public officials who are just embracing hateful ideologies. All of these things, the ability for people to have opinions on their phones and have platforms, all of these things have emboldened anti-Semites that have always been marginalized and now have a voice. And when that voice sometimes is actually looked at as legitimate, then they feel almost empowered to do really bad things, mm -hmm. i.e., Pittsburgh, the other places that turned out to where there was bloodshed. So, um, so the good news, I don't believe America is now a more anti-Semitic country. I just think the people that have always held these views feel more emboldened than ever before. How do we then put the genie back into the bottle? That's what this country needs to work at in many ways, not just anti-Semitism and all forms of hatred, but we got to like really kind of get the discourse to go to a whole different level. And the one thing, I'll, and then we'll, you can talk about other things, but when it comes to 
some of our response. And one of the things that I will say every time I'm interviewed and I get interviewed a lot when there's an incident, just a few weeks ago in West Rogers Park, the first thing I said to the person that interviewed me, I think it was at ABC was, I said, thank you for covering this. Thanks for not just saying, well, another anti-Semitic incident happened. This is just happened last week too. The minute we start to normalize this and the press doesn't make it a big deal, and they did make it a big deal in West Rogers Park two weeks ago. And you know, the state's attorney was there at the press conference and the superintendent of police was at the press conference and the mayor came out with a strong tweet. Like that's exactly what we need our elected officials to do when there's any form of anti-Semitism so it doesn't become normalized. Yeah, it needs to be re-stigmatized, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. which is stunning. Um, mm -hmm. So let's, and thank you for that. Let's yes, um, actually, you know what I realize uh, just for the folks who are here, um, the Q and A feature of this webinar is open. So if you have a question, uh, you're welcome to submit it into the Q and A um, button down likely at the bottom of your screen. We'll do our best to get to those either as we go uh, or toward the end uh, if there's time. So, so feel free um, you know, to, add, to type in your questions that way, um, anyone who'd like to do so. So let's talk for a second, Lonnie, just about the different ways anti-Semitism manifests itself. Uh -huh. um, not every way, um, but I think yeah. sort of the broad, the broad categories. Um, okay. And then I want to, in particular, sort of talk about and explore uh, the variance between uh, anti-Zionism and anti-Semitism and how we can learn uh, to identify which is which yeah. and when one is becoming the other. Okay. if they are in fact separated or not yeah. Yeah. um and then we can we can go uh sure. we can go deeper sure. that sure. way so anti-semitism does come from the left and from the right and i don't want to get into a, you know i've gotten a lot of discussions with people in our community about well it's much worse than the left and it's much worse than the right you know what it's bad on both and, and, it, and it plays itself out differently on both if you mm -hmm. look at it like on the right anti-semitism usually is more of the traditional anti-semitic type of canards about Jewish power, Jewish control, many of the ideologies of white nationalists, neo-Nazis, et cetera, are coming from the right. And just purely from a data perspective, the right anti-Semitism usually plays itself out in more violent ways. I think 85% of those you know, anti-Semitic acts that led to murder or violence were from, quote, right-leaning ideologies. On the left, it's it's equally troubling, but it doesn't manifest itself into violence per se, except for those situations where we have, um, you know, people that are on the left who then take it out, like we saw after the May Gaza incident, where there were many people on the left, so to speak, that were out there asking if you're a Jewish and punching you in LA and New York. Like that's coming and it's violent. But in terms of just data, that's what it is. But the left plays itself out, and we talked about anti Zionism. The anti Semitism on the left usually hides itself under the veneer of intellectualism and this notion that it's coming from academia or it's coming from progressive circles, but it usually isn't necessarily about Jews and power and like anti-Semitic canards going back to the protocols, but it's much more into the, to the lens of Israel, colonialism, subordination of uh, oppressors, all of that kind of language. And then it leads itself to when it leads itself to anti-Semitism is when they begin to say that Jews don't have the right to their own self-determination. That's when I call that anti-Semitism. Like if you are denying the right of Israel to exist and the Jewish people's right to determine their own fate, which is something that thank God we now have, that to me is, is just as anti-Semitic as someone saying that Jews control the world. And, and, and that piece of the anti-Semitism challenge is, is, is harder because it's not as in your face. Again, it's, it's couched in all of this other stuff, intersectionality, all the things we've talked about and you've talked about in sermons and all the rest. And so it's much harder. And so we're seeing this play out, play itself out really at the college level. And this is what makes it so hard for our kids is that they are many times ill-equipped to understand this nuance um, and they're being told they can't be a part of this circle because they're Jewish and they must support Israel and all the rest. And we have to explain to our kids that there's a distinction between somebody who has 
legitimate critique of Israel, someone that says, I don't believe in the settlements, or I don't believe in the way that Jews treat the Arabs in Israel proper. Okay, that's legitimate critique. And if you read the dailies in Israel, there's people that believe all kinds of stuff. Like that's that's being Jewish. That to me is what our kids should actually not, they shouldn't say, oh my God, there's anti-Semitism because they got in, I got in an argument with someone about the settlements. That's not what it is. But when it seeps into delegitimization of Israel, demonization of Israel, you know, Sharansky had that 3D test years ago, right? Double standard demonization and delegitimization. Then you're getting into something much more nefarious than just legitimate critique. And that's when our kids have to say, whoa, time out. You're, you're going down a road which is really offensive and anti-Semitic. Yeah, I mean, and I think th that sort of ability to distinguish is important for our kids. Yeah. And it's really important for those of us who have kids who are navigating this, those of us who are their grandparents, um, so that we can be of resource and support yeah. for them when it might be, it might be confusing. Um, and, and I know that's something that any number of, I'll call, I'll call them adults, struggle with themselves um, within the mainstream Jewish community. 100%. So if, if you'll allow me to, I want to raise one more thing about BDS. I think a lot of times in our community, we, we try about BDS and we're worried about our grandkids and our kids on campus. And oh my God, they're not going to have a good college experience. I think sometimes we almost have to just kind of take a deep breath on the issue of BDS. It's there. It's there on college campus. I just described it. The majority of our Jewish kids are having a fine time at Wisconsin and even Illinois where we have our own issues and we're dealing with all kinds of things. It's not great. The point is our kids aren't getting beaten up walking to the quad by having a Jewish star right now. It hasn't manifest, thank God, into that. What I worry about BDS isn't that a school is going to take on one of these ridiculous government resolutions about Sabra Hummus or about this, that, and the other because not one school in the entire country has ever then taken a government resolution and made it a part of the university, not one. So we've, we've pushed back enough to make sure that no university would ever do that. Where BDS concerns me is in two places. One is what we just described, that Jewish kid that's confused, that's told, hey, listen, you can't be a part of my club to about social justice because you're Jewish. That's not a pleasant experience. And our kids have to understand to kind of assert themselves to say, you know, let's talk about this because this is just not right. And we hope that we give our kids the right talking points. So I'm worried about that student that is being told you can't come here, et cetera, et cetera. But what's more concerning to me is let's take the kid from the young man, young woman from Omaha, Nebraska, who gets into Northwestern and they've never met a Jewish person before in their life. They go to Northwestern and this whole world opens up to them and liberal thought and whatever it may be, and they wanna get involved in everything, social justice, DEI, all this great stuff, equity, all this stuff that's hot button issues, which is, that's what college is for, explore. And they get hooked up into this kind of ideology about Zionism and Jews and, and how they treat people of color and colonialists and all the rest. And without us being able to like, give them opportunities to get more of the facts and all the rest, they become legitimate members of our society. They go to Northwestern, they're now running a newspaper. They're now walking the halls of Congress. They're now running a business. They're, they're at a bank, they're lawyers. They have access to a lot of important things and they have these pernicious views of Jews and Israel. That scares me. And that's where I think the battle has to be won for us to be able to take those, that kid from Omaha take that kid to Israel, explain the complexities. We may not be able to say, oh my God, I totally get it now. But all we're trying to do is if we take him to Israel and say like, oh boy, there's a lot more here than meets the eye. And we all know that. And that's why there's nothing that replaces these trips. And so we're gonna be doing a lot more trips to Israel. In fact, we have a bunch coming up. Thank goodness, hopefully the, it's opening up. But that's where I think we really need to focus our energies on that kid from Omaha. Because the, the members of SJP, Wendy, um, we're not gonna move them. They, they, they've grown up in this ideology, I mean, once in a while, but by and large, this is the way they're gonna be. And, and in any, they're gonna probably get more strident as they get older. It's those, it's those people that I just described that are malleable enough to be able to come to them and see that, wow, there's a lot here than just what I've heard when I was a 19 year old sophomore. 
Yeah. And I think within, I think a lot about like, where are the spaces that make sense to engage in education conversation where mm-hmm. there is the possibility of a deeper understanding, a more complex understanding, um, a growing edge, changing of the mind, whatever that might be. And right. where is it, you know, and it, it sort of saddens me to say this, but where is it a waste to dedicate our energy and our resources because there are no minds to be changed? Right. Um, right. And and I think we're, we're in a place where, um, that, that's that's a, a real concern. Um, and to flip it on its head, I think there is still a vast pool where there is a flexibility, there is a possibility of deepening a conversation and nuancing the conversation. And I worry less about our kids and more about the adults that our reflexes will so quickly go to, um, waving the banner of intolerance immediately mm-hmm. that there there is no space for deepening the conversation mm-hmm. taking someone on the trip to Israel right. because of the labels were so quick uh, to to impose um, across all categories and I, I I speak of that in my own personal reflexes just in mm-hmm. in that my ten, my own tendencies and and what I observe, and I think it's 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 really tricky mm-hmm. because at the same time I don't want to, nor do I want anyone else to sanction anti-Semitism or anything that might lead lead to it. Mm-hmm. Um, and when it comes to you know kind of campus conversations, I can't tell you how many of our own kids will often come back on Thanksgiving break or call while at school having encountered uh, a situation where someone um, said, maybe said something unintentionally or did something unintentionally that came across as anti-Semitic. And Mm -hmm. the reaction immediately is expel them, fire them, Um, Mm -hmm. you know, no place for hate Mm -hmm. Um, Mm -hmm. and, and all it, there might have been an intermediary step of conversation, learning, education um, in that in that middle. Um, and, and I think it's it's just something I'm going to name as I think a difficult discernment. Um, I think that is difficult. I think it's difficult. And it's difficult for organizations that have, you know, certain you know, constituencies that, you know, would demand X and, and maybe if you want to go Y, it's going to cost. So it's, it's, it's tricky. It is tricky, but you know, there's no question that, you know, dialogue, listening, getting a sense of people's experiences, where they're from and all the rest. I mean, that's the heart of ultimately flipping people is that you got to have that ability. So. Yeah, absolutely. So let's, um, let's talk a little, can we talk a little about Israel? Like what's yeah. on the ground in yeah. Israel? And, and I'm thinking in particular, you know, I, I'm, I'm grateful that um, the, the recent Amnesty International report on Israel, um, at least in my sense, did not get the massive coverage that I think many of us feared it would. Yeah. It did get some coverage, yeah. um, but it portrayed, it sort of laid out a picture um, that um, if one were to accept it, um, could lead one very easily to make certain assumptions about Israel that I think open the door to these conversations that really blur the line between anti-Zionism, anti-Semitism. Um, yeah. So I wonder if we can just talk about what is actually yeah. on the ground in Israel, the, yeah. the coalition, what's happening, sure. um, and just to your point, to deepen, to deepen and broaden the picture. Yeah. So this is, you know, we've had a conversation that hasn't been the most, you know, positive. It's been kind of, you know, we've talked about some heavy issues here and, and not a, not a lot of great signs that I delivered. But on this one, I think there's some positive things for us to kind of celebrate. And I think that what's what's ironic is that here's Amnesty coming out and calling Israel an apartheid state when just in the last year, you know, Israel brought in an Arab party to the coalition. 
Um, just last week, a the first Muslim Supreme Court justice was, you know, sworn in. Um, those aren't signs of an apartheid country. <laughs> so, so let's let's call that just it's it, you know it's it's almost comical the notion that Israel is an apartheid state. Does Israel have its issues and and complexities with respect to Palestinians? Of course, but the apartheid claim is so overblown and so ridiculous and and offensive. Um, and, and I got to tell you, when I was there in July, we had this window where like they were still letting people in during this whole COVID thing. I, I walked away really bullish in terms of what's happening there. Yes, there's challenges and they need to kind of, the economy took a major hit, as you can imagine, of course, because of COVID and all the rest. But take that aside, the government is actually working. For the first time in many years, they're getting stuff done. Even our local consulate now has a budget. Yanam Cohn, who's been our great new consul general, has like, dollars he can spend to do programs. You know, Aviv didn't have anything for three years. It just shows you just one glimpse of like the inefficiencies that were happening because there was such uncertainty every six months they had to go to new elections. Nothing was getting done. So there's movement. Budgets are getting done. There's a vision. There's a whole new set of ministers that are very diverse from women to people that are disabled coming from different parts of the world. I mean, this is the most diverse coalition this country has seen. And as a result, Bennett, while even he's probably further right ideologically than Bibi, has really, I think, you know, taken on this notion of I need to be a statesman and, and, and politics kind of put to the side, which is something I think we're all just clamoring for here in this country. It's like, let's work together to get stuff done. We have huge challenges. We're coming out of COVID. We've been hit by this, but there's so many things we can do if we work together. And that's the sense I got. And that's, you know, I was there in July and I'm still feeling that. And even the appointment of certain people like Nachman Shai, who understands the diaspora, Bennett understands the diaspora, Bougie Herzog, the new president, understands the diaspora. And I think many of us for many years now, and Wendy, you and I have talked about this, feel like, hey, we're here, like we're really important to the safety and security of Israel and it's, you know, it's longevity. Like, don't forget about us, you know, issues about the wall, all the different things that who's a Jew, all the things that animate us. Um, I think there's been, unfortunately, kind of like a blind spot for us. And I believe they got the memo. I'm, I'm, I'm feeling it as the head of JUF in Chicago. I, they want to hear from me. They want to hear what's on our minds. They want to hear what's important to us. Um, and Bougie, who ran Jaffe, the organization I was just talking about during this Ukrainian thing, you know, he has relationships with all of us, deep relationships, where he can pick up the phone and say, what's on the minds of, you know, people in the Midwest, what's happening in the West Coast, what's happening on campus. He gets this and he understands that if Israel kind of just blocks out the diaspora and just accepts dollars and, and what we do in this, that and the other, but don't care about our opinion, that does not bode well for them, especially the challenges we're facing with our 20 somethings who are feeling disconnected, which our studies are showing. So. If, if you don't show love and you don't figure out ways to kind of like make them a part of this mosaic, I think Israel is going to have a really tough time engaging that generation. But the good news is I think they, they're getting it and they're finally pivoting to a place where I feel much more comfortable and I'm excited about it. And I don't think there's going to be a whole thing with transition of power from Bennett ultimately to Lapid. I think it's going to go smooth um, and I think he'll hand over the reins the way that it was carved out. And they'll continue to cobble away with this little, you know, really tenuous coalition and continue to get stuff done. And the last piece, and then we can talk about the other, but the normalization treaties that have happened with the Gulf states, as you know, Wendy, are just, it's a seismic. Miraculous. Movement. It's, it is, it's miraculous. And, you know, I don't want to get political, but, you know, there's some people that say, well, uh, the bottom line is, regardless of what administration did this, it was an amazing accomplishment and we should really continue to get the greatness of this and it's happening in and just just a couple days ago you know Egypt CC had an amazing energy conference and he walked over to Harari who's the energy secretary in you saw that in Israel she's she's a woman in a wheelchair she's the energy cabinet minister in Israel she went to the conference in Egypt and he put down his stuff in a huge room and went over to her and embraced her like that wouldn't have happened two years ago Unimaginable so, two years ago. Unimaginable, totally unimaginable. You know, Herzog's going to Bahrain, Bennett's going to UAE. There's good stuff happening. Is the Palestinian issue still obviously a problem? Of course. 
And, and maybe there's be some traction as a result of the Gulf states maybe leaning in differently than before. But we're at a different place. And, and I'm, I think this is gonna be good for our next generation to see what they're seeing. I think it's good for the region. Um, you know, Israel is always who knows, tomorrow can spell something different. But this is a right now, I'm more bullish than bearish in terms of Israel. Nice, thank you for that. Yeah, I often say that if, if people are interested in seeing intersectionality really at work, they should yeah. look they should look on the ground in Israel. Um, yeah. You know, not to say that it isn't messy sometimes. Um, of course, listen, democracy is messy. Correct. No yeah. one ever said it needed to be tied up in a in a bow in a box, you know, and and be all pretty. It's just the question of does it move? Can it um, can it create progress? And there's a really powerful example of that across all sorts of lines um, in Israel. That's been true for a long time, but I mean, this new coalition really brings that to bear, kind of in the face of everyone or anyone who's willing to look to see it. Yeah. Um, so you feel, so you feel that way also? Absolutely. Because okay. um, we haven't really talked about that. I, I, I'm happy that you're feeling that as a rabbi of an important, you know, congregation in, a, in an important city, that you're feeling that as well. Good. Yeah, and I don't say that from a political perspective. Mm -hmm. I say that from a, a truly like a, a, a universal perspective. If somebody wanted to see an example of diverse individuals, <laughs> somehow making something be and work right. and or move yep. um, you really it's it's right there um mm -hmm. and and like i said not necessarily uh, pretty all the time but it's yep. it's there um yep. Yep. and 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 i think you know um, I just think it requires opening one's eyes to see rather than accepting narrative, short, simple narratives that are spewed in little sound bites mm -hmm. um, and taking whatever they, whatever that is at its word, you know, um, the picture is always more complicated and often more beautiful. Um, so, and, and I think that's one of the things we can see, we, we can see there. Um, absolutely. And I think it's a miracle that that coalition is still in existence. So, um, you know, amazing. Um, let's, let's bring it back domestic, if that's okay. okay. Um, and, and I, and I want to bring it into a place of self-interest for, um, synagogues specifically. Um, and just, I, I got a note in the middle of this webinar. Um, oh, the Q and A now does seem to be working. Great, it wasn't working before, but I guess now it's it's working. Um, so I'll, I'll come back to those Q&A questions. I was gonna say to folks here that if the Q&A is not working, you can enter your questions in the chat and that should work as well. Um, but let's, let's come to synagogues. Um, so in my mind, really Pittsburgh was the um, major shift in, um, synagogues and how they how we think about our safety our security it's not that we weren't thinking about it before um but there was there was some sort of ground shift that occurred in the sort of um mindset of of anyone i think going into worship services in particular or coming into a synagogue for any reason uh, after that and i know that that um any time there's been an attack or an act of anti-Semitic hate in whatever form on a synagogue, it sort of gets kindled uh, and catalyzed. Yeah. Um, and of course now post Colleyville, I think there's unbelievable amplification and justifiably so of, of this of this fear. Yeah. Um, and it's it's you know going back to sort of the the not 50 million anti, new anti-Semites, but this, this core um, that has always existed, likely will always exist. Yeah. Um, and um, I'd say now the power in their hands to do real significant devastation, yeah. not just um, in word or in a spray paint bottle, um, you know, but in, in violence and murder. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think for many of us, you know, 
there's not a Shabbat that goes by when I'm sitting in our congregation where I'm not now trained to look around, think in a sort of paranoid way about where are the exits? What am I going to do if this happens? I have a I have a panic button in my pocket at all times in our synagogue, as do all of our staff. Mm-hmm. Um, so I wonder if you can talk a little bit about synagogue security yeah. in the context of 2020 and post anti-Semitism. Yeah. Well, first off, it pains me for you to say that, but I'm happy you said that. It's a weird feeling for me to hear what you just said about how every Shabbat you're thinking about this and you have a panic button. Like, that's sad that you have to, but I'm also really happy that you're taking those precautions. And I just want to name, I just want to name, it's a luxury like, right. I don't yeah. want to make it sound like every synagogue, all their no, staff have panic buttons. We're lucky right. at North Shore. Now. I know you have the so resources just, to do that. Exactly. So, so, so let's play on the resource thing. And, and so, so while JUF's ultimate function is to take care of the most vulnerable and engage the Jewish community. Like if people were to ask like, so what's the mission statement of JUF? That's what I'd say. Take care of the most vulnerable and we engage the Jewish community. And engaging Jewish community can be all kinds of things. But nowhere in that mission statement is that we are securing the Jewish community. But if you think about it, I'm not going to get anybody to engage in a temple or in early childhood or at a day camp or a day school if they're worried that their kids could be in jeopardy or themselves. So it's like you almost have to like it's the precursor to the engagement is making sure that you are in a safe and secure place. And then you have the challenge of, well, how inviting should we be? Do we really want cop cars and people with big you know, guns hanging out? Like that's not embracing and saying, come on in. Like that's like, oh God, it's like the way you feel in Europe. So we have to play with that complexion of it. But going back to JUF, I realized early on in my tenure here that while JUF has done security for the buildings that JUF owns, which are significant in our community, there's still another 160 or so buildings, including yours, Wendy, that, you know, JUF's our small little security team would help with a, you know, come and do a, a report of how it looks, but not to the scope that I think we need. So to answer your question, I realized during COVID that while we may have a reprieve on bad people doing bad things to Jewish institutions because Jews aren't there, because no one was there, um, it's going to kick up. And sure enough, my instincts are right by Colleyville. And, and I'd be shocked, unfortunately, if we didn't see things happen in the next year. Like it's, it's a matter of when, unfortunately, not if. Um, so we are embarking on a, a significant campaign called Live Secure. Um, and thankfully, we've already gotten a very large gift to start it. And we have just hired a brand new security director from Chicago Police, who I work with, named Daniel Godsell. He will know everybody in the next six months, all 185 Jewish institutions. I guarantee it, Daniel will make his presence felt. And Daniel, through this fund, will be able to build a team, the team that will have an assistant, a team that will have a grant writer. And why I want a grant writer is because right now there are three potential buckets of dollars that synagogues can apply for to get new equipment, to get the panic button you talked about, to get maybe some new you know, glass windows that have better you know, security systems in them, et cetera. Federal money has $180 million. We're pushing hard through legislation and through advocacy efforts to get that legislation up to 360 million. Of the 180 million, about 75% went to Jewish institutions, even though Christians and Muslims can apply for it also. It's faith-based, it's not Jewish, but you know, we just have the wherewithal to do it. State, JB just basically announced $20 million for state nonprofit grants. And then we'll have our own dollars for those that don't get it on those side for we'll be able to fund grants, which we've done for a long time, but we'll have that ability as well. So we'll hire a grant writer. We're probably gonna have somebody that can do audits, that can go to a small little show in West Rogers Park that may not have a lot of resources, but be able to say, all right, here's what you need. And then be able to facilitate that little small institution of getting what they need. So this is going to be something that we will, a year from now, as I'm talking to you, hopefully I will have a significant team that is doing the types of things I just described. So no institution can ever say, we just didn't have the money to secure ourselves in the right way. That's, I don't want that to be a narrative that in our city. So we are going to work on it. And thankfully, again, going back to the generosity of this community, this isn't going to be a huge campaign for all 25,000 JUF donors. It's going to go to certain segments of our community that can step up in a major way. And it's going to be through a fund and it'll go on in perpetuity. 
Which is amazing. And, you know, it's on the one hand, it's, it's a Shonda that we have to be thinking about yeah. this and doing this and, you know, using our, our resources in this way. On the other hand, it's incredible that our community can do this. NSCI has benefited. I, I couldn't even begin to quantify it by the wisdom of JUF's security team, the mm -hmm. funds and the grants that you've already administered um, over many years now. Mm -hmm. um, and I know so many of our other synagogues and institutes, Jewish institutions have as well. Um, and we, we truly couldn't do it um, without JUF. Um, mm -hmm. It's it's something that holds us all together, and and I know um, I know I speak for our whole team in gratitude to you and to your whole team who uh, who makes that possible. Sure, thank um, you. It, it's it's absolutely true. Yeah. Um, so one last kind of topic, and then we'll have a few minutes. There's I, at least one question up in the Q and A box. Okay. So. Um, it's funny when we scheduled this, I didn't look at the Jewish calendar, but tonight marks Rosh Chodesh of mm -hmm. the second Adar, <laughs> okay. um, which is funny, uh, you know, it's a leap year, but what that means is we are now in the month when Purim will occur. And, um, you know, Purim of course is one of the paradigmatic early uh, texts navigating this narrative of an anti-Semite in power, <laughs> looking to eradicate the Jews. Um, and, and I personally, in, you know, in, and we all know how the story goes, um, but there's one part of the story that um, I found, I, I sort of focused on a few years ago and, and it, it, it strikes me as this um, really compelling place. So, um, you know, Esther is in the palace. She presumably is set up in this position of power and, um, Mordechai calls her on it and is, is, is like, hey, you're married to the king. He could do something about this whole situation. You got to say something. And she initially demurs. And he says, listen, Esther, um, if you choose to demur, I'm colloquializing, um, <laughs> we, we, the Jewish people, will be fine. We'll figure it out. But you, you won't be fine. Um, and it's this real call out to Esther as an individual who had some agency mm -hmm. to do something, yeah. to, to not just say, ah, oh, well, you know, what can I possibly do? The story's already written. I'm not going to change anybody's mind. You know, it's this interesting call to the impact of one individual. Mm -hmm. um, and it compels her, obviously, to, to play out the rest of the story as it does. Um, but it gives me, you know, Mordechai's wisdom is that like, we'll figure it out. Somehow it's going to be okay. You know, it's this idea that, um, yeah, the world is held in the hand of every single individual, but also like things tend to move to the okay. And we should, we should be optimistic in that. Um, and I think a lot about that narrative in terms of us as a Jewish community navigating this, this reality of an increase of anti-Semitism, which I know for many of us can feel overwhelming and like it's a story that's written and it's, it's just gonna play out how it plays out and there's nothing that we can do about it. At the same time, we are all um, individuals likely with more power than we've ever had in terms of communication, in terms of access um, and, and societal mobilization. So I'm wondering, you know, in the seat in which you sit, when you think about the things that the Esters can do, and mm -hmm. by the Esters, I mean, you know, any of us who mm -hmm. have, we're not the one in the seat of power, but we could talk to the person in the seat of power. We could mm -hmm. call them. We could mm -hmm. email them, you know, um, we're, we're not helpless here. Right. Um, what are those things that we should be thinking about that we should be doing? Okay. Good. That's a great one. And I swear to the audience, we didn't really, we didn't, yeah. other ones we just kind of talked about before. And we haven't, so I'm thinking I'm on, my, on one foot in this one, but I think that, you know, all of us, I think you're right. Most of us have access to people that can have agency is the, the word that you used. 
Um, and what I saw after May, when I think all of us were really worked up by the gross mischaracterization of Israel as the aggressor, et cetera, et cetera. And we saw those influencers and the John Olivers of the world and Trevor Noah's that got everyone worked. Oh my God. And our kids came to us and said, look what's on TikTok. Look what's on Instagram. We went, oh my God, the world's coming to an end. There's all these people that hate Israel and hate Jews. Like we really, we lost it during May. And I, me included, like what is going on? There's this tsunami of anti-Israel invective um, that is right there in anti-Semitism. We actually moved its way. And we get worked up and all the rest. So what I saw coming out of that, though, was really kind of a neat thing. Businesses. Like, if you're a lawyer at a law firm, you can say to your managing partner, you know what? I want to do a symposium on anti-Semitism and how anti-Semitism should be something that we stand against and that we stand up when there's something like this, that we need to have a voice the same way we are for other forms of hate. If you have relationships with elected officials and you're upset with their silence, you, you know, play it out. If you are, you know, if you have friends who are at other institutions or you work at a bank or you work at a place, like you can make change. Um, and, and especially when it comes to our friends in the interfaith world as well, is that, you know, there weren't a lot of people coming from different parts of our community when we've seen this uptick in anti-Semitism. Really, and and so if we have these relationships, and Wendy, you and I do as well, and we're working at it, but the more we get people to sit down with their Christian friends, their African-American friends, their Muslim friends, their Asian friends, and say, hey, we're all in this together. Like, we gotta, we gotta stand up when something happens. One thing I will tell you on the negative side, when West Rogers Park happened two weeks ago, and they had the press conference, there were, besides the superintendent and the state's attorney, there were only Jews. And here's West Rogers Park, which is arguably probably the most integrated part of the city, where actually it is a beautiful mosaic of all different types of ethnicities. And, and there's, there's Pakistanis and there's, it's, it's, it's great. It's like, it's what, you know, a lot of other cities hope to be. Yeah. But there was, there, was, there was no group together that said, we stand up against this. And I thought that was a real miss. And so, you know, I'm meeting with the commander next week to talk about how maybe CPS and we'll help them. I mean, CPD, we can help them kind of put together groups from the community in West Rogers Park. So when the Pakistani community gets hit with something, we're out there as well saying, no, hate's not going to survive in our community. So there are those types of grassroots things that really do make a difference. And if we care about this stuff, we can't just kind of sit back and say, oh, that sucks. You know, like we get up and we do something about it. And I just gave you a couple examples. Those are, those are fantastic examples. Thank you. And I mean, I think that's the real, you know, the real key is identifying the spheres of influence that we have, which yeah. might not be the entire city or the entire country. They might be our law firm um, or, or our kids' Girl Scout troop or whatever it might be. But there are places to yeah. um, re- um, refocus our mm -hmm. energies um, and, and, and claim something for ourselves there. And there's nothing wrong yeah. with that. There's nothing wrong with that. And I think a lot of times we have a tendency in our community is, to, you know, this whole notion of shot or like, you know, you hear about that from our parents, like, oh, there was a, sh like, especially, we, we're not like that. We shouldn't be like that. And when it comes to anti-Semitism, we shouldn't be like that. Like, and, and the notion that, oh, I don't want to be annoying to my non-Jewish friends. Like, I think that's kind of lame. Like, I, I think we should be assertive. And I think we should say, hey, this is who I am. This means a lot to me as I would be there for you. And let's talk about this. Right. So. Yeah, thank you for that. Um, I, I in, in my mind, that's that's the question I always kind of go to is, is what is the place of the individual, the normal average yeah. Jew or the person in a Jewish family that loves Jews, <laughs> what's the response? What's the counter? What's the place of, of you know, of, of, of not just sitting back um, and letting it happen? Right. Uh, so, so I appreciate that. Sure. Um, gosh, it is, it is already eight o'clock. I <laughs> look at how, look what happens when you and I are yapping, it goes fast. I know, I know. Um, so I, I want to honor everybody's time, and um, maybe there is just this one question still here, and and it's it's a little bit of a controversial question. Um, so, but I 
I'm going to guess it's okay to sort of talk about it because it navigates within the realm of, of much of what we've talked about. Um, so, and this is, I'm not giving you a lot of time to answer this question. <laughs> is, this, is, this Karen, is this Karen's question? Yeah, exactly. Do you see it? Um, okay. In all so, full disclosure, Karen and I worked together for many years at ADL. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> So I'm not surprised and, she gave me she gave me a, a tough question. Um, you know, again, this is this is when sometimes the geopolitical realities of the world um, are a part of people's calculations. Uh, let's just leave it at that. And um, you know, I, I do know there's been some statements made, um, but you know, could Israel be out there more? Uh, actually, Robert asked. Uh, <laughs> not surprised on that either. I hope you're still ushering, Robert, by the way. You're an amazing usher and you're a great volunteer at North Shore. I know that. Um, no, but I mean, like, you know, I'm not going to be critical of Israel because they know a lot more about what this can mean. There's Syria implications. There's Iran implications. There's China implications here. But at the end of the day, you would like to see that, you know, from a Jewish perspective, we speak up, we speak out, and that's how we're, how we're wired there's a lot more complexity than meets the eye here. And by the way, I should say, there may be a lot going on behind the scenes that we don't know about where they're moving the needle on important issues in terms of this as well. We, we, I don't know that, but my gut tells me there's stuff that we don't know that's going on. And especially when it comes to saving and like, you can be certain that planes and anything that, that they need and Jaffe is a part of the Israeli government. So Correct. I sometimes actions may be more important than actually statements. Yeah, thank you for saying that. One of the things that I was going to say is just like what we were talking about before, I think everything is always much more complicated um, than these, you know, these sing a single viewpoint into one aspect of, of a larger situation. Um, and, and I can't respond to what the political navigation is like for Israel other than um unless I was in Israel, I wouldn't respond about that because I think that the reality of existence there in that geopolitical framework is something that we in the United States actually can't understand. We face nothing like it. Um, so in, in terms of, of asserting an opinion about that, but I, I will say that I, I, noted, I noted that the same day that I started to see that critique kind of and hear that critique, I also noted that Israel had sent in any number of medics, um, resources, um, people on the ground, funds, ways to save people, get them out, treat them. Um, yeah. And, and you know, the it, it, it isn't just this one um, aspect of, of that situation that, I, and I think it's important to kind of know, but I think it's complicated. It is, yeah. life's complicated. <laughs> always. Um, so Lonnie, um, yeah. really on behalf of everyone here, uh, here right now, and anyone who will see this later, um, yeah. I want to thank you uh, for this conversation, but much more importantly for everything you and your colleagues do that we see, and more importantly, that we don't see, to advocate on the part of the Jewish community in its fullness. Mm -hmm. um, which in my mind is the, is the greatest stance of resistance that we have against anybody who, who wants to say otherwise um, mm. about the incredible people, faith, group, however we wanna understand it, family, that is, um, that is the Jewish people. Um, and uh, I, I'm grateful that you're one of the one of the faces that represents us in in that grand way. So oh, thank you for your time. Oh, I really enjoyed uh, it. Anytime. Awesome. Um, so friends from NSCI, uh, just so you know, this conversation is uh, will is being recorded and it'll be posted up on our anti responding to anti semitism page on our website, where there are a ton of resources um, and other conversations that we've had over the last few years. Um, nav about how to navigate uh, this, this reality. And if there are any follow-up questions, just please reach out to me, uh, email me, call me, and I'm happy to continue uh, the conversation. Sounds good. Wishing everyone uh, a good, safe, healthy, and happy, and joyous, I should say, second month of Adar.
if you haven't already been enjoying the first month of Adar. <laughs> um, I know that like, as it was the, the timing of now being able to sometimes be in environments without a mask is a little bit um, ironic for the month in which we arrive in Purim where it's all about masks, but right. there's something about demasking that seems you know, original uh, mm. these days. So I look forward to being able to see more and more uh, faces uh, embodied and together as we go. Thanks everybody. Bye everyone. Thanks Wendy. Thank Thanks so much, Lonnie. Bye, Bye everybody.